Hello, and welcome to Speak Truth to Power, Lessons from Serbanica. I'm Karen Robinson, the Human Rights Education Program Director of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. And today I'm thrilled to be joined by two change makers, Emil Sotrojek and Sed Gujeres. Apologies. Um, Amir is the director of the Serbanica Memorial Center and a survivor of the Serbanica genocide. Sevd is a Speak to to Power human rights activist at the George School, where she is a senior. Today, we will take a closer look at the Serbanica genocide and discuss the steps necessary to prevent further atrocities in the future. Welcome, Amir and Sevd. Before we begin our conversation, I'd like to introduce you to our organization. Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights advocates for human rights issues and pursues strategic litigation to hold governments accountable at home and around the world. Speak Truth to Power is our human rights education program that combines storytelling and interactive learning to promote the next generation provide the next generation with concrete knowledge and the skills needed to be change agents and advance human rights. Sev, as part of this program, I will let you lead the discussion from here. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Amir, and thank you to all of you who are watching today. If you have any questions for us, please drop them in the comment section below and we'll answer them as time permits. Now, let's start our discussion. Amir, your story is a powerful one. It's one that can teach all of us many important lessons in regards to the atrocities humans can inflict upon one another. In your book, Postcards from the Grave, you tell the story of the Srebrenica genocide. Would you mind sharing with the audience a bit of your story and what happened in Srebrenica? Well, um, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor. Um, and... Uh, I'm, you know, if I can in any way contribute to Srebrenica inspiring people to do good things, uh, to help other folks in trouble, I'll be, uh, I'll be more, ha more than happy uh, to do it. Now, 30 years ago, I was uh, a 17 year old um, when the war broke um, in Bosnia. And my family, myself, um, my, my parents, my sister, myself, we ended up um, in this tiny little town of Srebrenica in May 1992 already. Um, now, the, the town sort of continued, well, not sort of, but continued to be under siege for the next three years and um, until let's say April or May 1993, it looked like straight out of, and I'm not overdoing this, but straight out of some post-apocalyptic movie. Because um, that's what we were reduced to. Um, and then in April 1993, the UN came in, uh, disarmed the Bosnian army uh, in the enclave, established a safe area, um, and failed to move the Serbs back from around the enclave, as was the deal under the UN Security Council resolution providing for their very presence there. Um, two and a half um, years later, um, in July 1995, um, after a you know long deliberation, the Bosnia Serb um, political authorities and military authorities decide to make a push for the eastern enclaves. Srebrenica wasn't the only enclave in the east of the country. Um, there was also Zepa and Gorazde. And um, it was part of their vision that the way to end the war would be to exterminate remaining enclaves of Muslims, of Bosnian Muslims, in eastern Bosnia, um, which was one of the <laughs> declared goals uh, of the Bosnia Serb political authority or authorities uh, at that time. Now, me, I had, um, how can I say, front row seat to the international failure to prevent even the littlest possible um, loss of life. 
Um, I ended up working as an interpreter for the uh, for a UN outfit called uh, United Nations Military Observers, and that's what essentially saved my life. Um, in addition to my colleague reporting it, reporting to our bosses um, who were outside Srebrenica, uh, that the Dutch were about to hand us over to the Serbs. So we were kind of, you know, dead men walking for about a week or so um, before this one American guy, two American guys, who were um, sitting in the office, literally, I mean, you know, uh, sitting in the office above us, um, symbolically speaking, you know, who were in the chain of command above us, one Edward Joseph and one Kenneth Beiser essentially went to bat for Hassan Nuhanovic, for me, and uh, about a dozen uh, or more other local employees at the UN headquarters. Um, I, I feel ashamed that I never got to actually sit down with either one of them to ask them to recount that for me and, and for us. I uh, never kind of dared to look at the other side of it and see that my life may have depended on um, this or that particular reading of a contract that I signed in, in uh, sometime in late 1993. Um, when it was all over, um, after, as I said, three and a half years and after getting of Severinsa, um, I have lost my father, my uncle, um, essentially um, more male members of my family have died, have been killed uh, or died than have survived. Um, and that's an interesting aspect to the Serb genocidal um, atrocities here in, 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 in Eastern Bosnia in particular and in Bosnia in general, this um, combination of physical annihilation of men and um, systematic rape of women. These two elements combined in an attack, if you will, on, on the body of the, of the Muslim, the Bosnian Muslim population in this country, in this part of the country. So um, I guess that's a kind of a very long-winded answer to your, uh, well, equally long-winded question. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's uh, part of the story, I guess, that's, uh, that's out there anyway. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, my next question is more of, for today, what do you see the biggest challenge to human rights today? Well, um, it's it's a little above my pay grade, really. Uh, I think there are people out there who, um, you know, who are presidents and prime ministers who should be who should be answering these questions. Uh, I'm in no position of power. I'm in no position to. Um, take or impose any decisions on on anyone. Um, but, you know, from where I'm standing, the greatest threat to us all comes from this threat of uh, threat to democracy. Uh, and we've seen this um, almost a counter revolution, you know, globally speaking, uh, and, 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 and a, and a revival or resurrection of authoritarian regimes the world over. Um, you know, Lukashenko, I mean, you know, I'm not even going to mention Putin. And I believe that, you know, where where democracy fails, um, where democracy is weak, you know, there there are I don't believe in the theory about two democracies not fighting one another, uh, and not going to war to you know with one another. That's that's not a not something that I would subscribe to. Um, but I, you know, I believe that, that that's where the threat to peace comes from mostly and, and, um, a threat to peace is, is a threat to us all. Um, I, I suppose also that we're, we will be very soon nearing the stage where climate change will also constitute a threat to peace, um, where people will move 
and and there will be more movement of people across the globe and people will move more and more motivated by by climate uh, by by the inability to continue living where they where they live now so um but generally speaking i'm you know I, i'm more, i'm concerned about the state of peace um and right now you know in ukraine we're dealing with a government and a state that's completely not accountable to anybody and, and has a huge nuclear arsenal and that i find a, a horrific prospect okay. thank you um so what are the qualities that make someone a human rights defender well honestly uh i've i'm not i'm i'm not going you know i'm probably going to give you an answer that you may not necessarily like but some of the greatest um activists human rights activists uh were the people who um were the the, the survivors or the victims of any of, of a particular event um I've looked at and I've seen mothers of Srebrenica work, um, I've, you know, and if there is an organization, if there is a, a group of women that embody your motto about speaking truth to power, then it's the, the mothers and daughters of Srebrenica. And, and there are many reasons for it. You know, none of this, where I'm sitting now, um, None of this, this this place would be part of a completely different geography if it wasn't for them, um, and I mean literally, you know. And and the other thing is that you know nobody gave them a chance. I, what I love about their story is that nobody gave them a chance because you know they, these were not um, your urban educated you know um, women. These were rural, conservative, covered, you know, uh, had gear on women from Severin, Muslim women from Severin, and that was um, an uphill struggle. Um, so, what are the qualities that make them and that make other great human rights activists and, and defenders? Um, I guess. There is a the, the 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 biggest part of it is is, is a vision of a freer of a, of a more just society, and and then you know the drive to to do it, and where you get that drive very often makes the difference, um, and that's why we you know we're talking about mothers of Plaza, Plaza de Mayo. That's why we're talking about mothers of Srebrenica. So that's why, and it's very interesting that most of these women, uh, most of these mo movements are actually, have been formed and organized and fueled by, by women. Um, so, you know, I don't see a similar group of men, um, you know, making similar demands. So would you say that the Mothers of Srebrenica group is a group that has inspired you a lot? Or is there any other groups that you'd like to? I, I honestly, I started my career. I was a very young journalist in their early in, in the early days of their activism, you know, and I kind of watched all of them grow and, and um, go through, you know, like the, the process um, and they started out as a movement, and they started out as a literally a force of nature. Um, not, nowadays, they're a lot more savvy. They know the person. You know, you, nobody can make a fool out of these ladies. You know, absolutely nobody. They know, they know their procedures. They know who to call. They know, you know, what to say. They're well briefed. They have their talking points. You know, back then in ninety six, ninety seven. I mean. Um, they were a completely different group of women and everybody made them out to be scarier than they were let's be honest because they were asking a question that went to the heart of to, to the conscience of this country to the conscience of this society and they were asking all the tough questions uh, and they were asking all those tough questions everyone and you know looking at them my problem is that i know them all right and my problem is that i can actually i get to joke with them and and i you know i get to be i don't know um and that they like me obviously i mean you know i'm a, for the most of for most of them i actually know them my whole life and um so you know 
but when you take a step back and you, you know even when when someone like me who's close to them takes a step back and when you see this path that's behind them and when, when you see what they achieved along that path that's just fascinating that's just you know and once again um I, when i say no one gave them a chance i really mean it you know no one ever gave them any chances what is um a moment that stands out to you when you spoke truth to power um, and how did that moment change you well i don't know i mean if you could call it speaking truth to power but i guess if if, if i were looking for one certain moment, for one moment in my life that where I didn't buckle um, and which I survived, um, that would have been this meeting with with Radko Mladic here in just outside my office, my present day office. And so, but I don't think it was it was a it was a moment for me. I think. I think to be completely honest, I came out ready, out of separate ready, ready and willing to, you know, take this fight for as long as it takes. And I remember um, going to this public debate with a bunch of writers immediately after the end of the war and after I came out of Severinsa to this bunch of writers. Um, who uh, came from the Netherlands. Uh, and when I showed up there and, and I said um, I was a survivor, there was a, there was a little bit of consternation. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it, it, honestly, um, I had one moment in my life. You know, there's Once again, there are a lot of things that happen to you in your life. I mean, you know, you, you very rarely do things come down to one moment, but they may come down to one uh, period as well. And, and for me, I guess that one of the most important periods in my entire life um, was when I worked as a correspondent from the tribunal at the, at, the, at the Hague, from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And you know, it was a very bizarre situation for me. It was a situation where I, a survivor and a victim of some of the events that are being tried in that particular court, am supposed to be sitting in the press pool and report objectively about what happened, even though it involved my relatives, my friends, people I knew, my country, my people. And the people who were on the inside um, didn't really ha relate to that particular experience. These were prosecutors and judges and even police investigators from the outside world. The entire procedure was taking place in was, was completely different to anything that you see when you go to courtroom in to court in Bosnia. It took place in a, once again in a different language. It took place in English and French. Um, if you went there as a survivor, you actually, you know, they had to translate what you said for the record because the judges were also from all over the world. Um, and I have to say, I've seen a lot of injustice there as well. I have to be honest. You know, I don't want to um, draw any parallels, but for me, it was it, it, that, that was my Lemkin moment. Um, and I, I don't want to presume um, to you know, uh, to be anywhere near Raphael Lemkin in that regard. But what I'm saying is, I, I could actually understand how he must have felt at the Nuremberg Tribunal when Holocaust didn't even make it into the indictment as a separate count of the indictment. So you know, for me, it was it was it was many of those experiences. I guess the injustice of me surviving, for instance, the the, the meeting with the Mladic, with Mladic, um when thousands upon thousands of others didn't you know there's a, there's things that that you know life is simply just life you know 
It's not, 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 it throws, throws things at you. It throws things at, I was beaten up. I remember, you know, as a student being beaten up uh, by some right wing thugs. And I'm a big guy, so, and there was a bunch of them, <laughs> I promise. And, and no, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't look how they, you know, what they look like, because I, I, I got really, I really got kicked. Um, but what I'm saying is, is, you know, I guess my life, my, 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 the tw first 20 years of my life, and, and in particular, the period between my, the age of 17 and the age of 20 made me predestined to, you know, um, take this, to accept this calling, to accept this struggle as mine. Um, you know, I, I guess that in many ways I, was, I wasn't even asked, you know, I, 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 I don't think I've ever actually even had a, had a chance to consider doing something else in my life uh, after the age of 20. Before the age of 20, I, you know, I still had chances of, you know, doing something else with my life. And how would you say that moments at the tribunal and I guess your time at the tribunal changed you like, and your activism for the rest of your like career? Well, um, I became more cynical. <laughs> is that, <laughs> is that a good answer? Um, uh, I became much more aware of, um, of two things. Um, First of, 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 but two things that need to, how can I say, need to, to, to work with one another. You know, for, 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 we are a pretty unique situ institution and we're a pretty unique community, community of the, of, you know, of the survivors of Severinsa. And, you know, what happened to us is that everything that, 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 that we survived became, or almost everything, or not nearly everything, well, however you want to put it, and all three would be correct. Um, it, the only thing that happened to us is the stuff that was actually taken to court. Okay, so we ended up with a very judicial version of history. We ended up with history that's really driven by prosecutors and their strategies and their tactics. And in the end of the day, the procedure, you know, and I'm talking about uh, this Anglo-Saxon court procedure. I'm, you know, the, the continental is a little bit different. Uh, because, and anyway, so we're now at the situation where we literally have about two or 300 stories that are part of the judicial record. And nothing else, you know, the presumption is now that nothing else happened. This is it. These are your testimonies. They were given in court. End of story. And that's what the Hague taught me that, that, that that's not true. It's really not true that that there is an entire history to be written about courts and court proceedings and about events that 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 are being examined by courts. Um, it taught me that history is much wider, but it's also much less elegant than people would like it to be. Um, it taught me that, well, and it taught me that we actually really have to stand up for ourselves and to stop being victims or victims alone. Uh, because being a, a victim very often really is, how can I say that? And, and I don't want to. You know, we need, uh, let, let, let me rephrase that. You know, the tribunal taught me to take responsibility for, for myself, for, you know, because there I was, and, and that we should take responsibility for, our, for ourselves, because, you know, um, that's it. That was the most we could get. That was the most that we could get. We uh, we couldn't get the stuff that our our friends and our allies in Ukraine are getting today. So what we got stuck with and what we got was a bunch of judgments. 
So, you know, take it for what it is. Um, my bigger problem is, and, and move on. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, but once again, there is an entire history to be written about those judgments. There is an entire history to be written about those events. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the Memorial Center has in three last three years alone interviewed probably as many witnesses as uh, the tribunal did in the 20 plus years that it existed. And that's because we're not prosecutors. We do not seek to indict and send someone to prison. We seek to record history. We seek to record oral history. Uh, and we do that in the most uh, competent manner possible and with, you know, working with people who do that, you know, like on, who are experts in, in that. So, um, yeah, I guess that would be it. I guess that's, that's what the tribunal taught me. I, I guess I, in, in, in ways I grew up there, honest to God. Right. So is there anything that you think the world learned from this genocide or you wish that to learn the world should have like massive learned? Um, okay. I'm, yeah. I'm a little, um, cautious to sort of use the word genocide liberally or too liberally. I believe that we should always be gravi you know, aware of the gravity of, of the word and the gravity of the crime. Um, but I believe that, you know, Ukraine has shown that some lessons at least have been learned. Um, and Ukraine has shown that lesson number one, to help the weaker in the, fa in the face of, a, of an aggressor, of a bigger and stronger aggressor, is, is literally, um, how can I say, you know, Rule number one. Rule number one is get in and get in early and and um, and so intervene. Of course, intervene. You know, it's not as if it's not as if you know Ukrainians are not asking for those weapons and for those guns and for all the help that can be given to them. And they are willing to defend their country. And people willing to defend their country should be help. You know, should be helped in defending their countries. Very simple. Um, Secondly, you know, to the extent that there is a plan to um, to how can I destroy Ukrainian identity uh, uh, and Ukrainian state, I think there that, that, that in, at least in some actions we're seeing some actions by the Russian military we're seeing um, measures taken with the uh, with the, with the intent to destroy any traces of Ukrainian identity, burning books, uh, or changing curriculums, bringing in teachers from um, Russia, um, deporting or for, yeah, deporting Ukrainian children in th their thousands into Russia. Uh, God only knows what we have there. So there is an operation to literally sanitize uh, the Ukrainian identity off of the UK Ukrainian soil to remove um, uh, uh, Ukraine as a, as a sovereign state from the map, as a historical term as well. Uh, this is an attempt to literally erase Ukrainian nation and Ukrainian history from history. Um, whether that uh, is in all its aspects, uh, 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 whether all, you know, whether we can, whether we can testify about. All of the aspects of this policy being genocidal, I don't know at this point. I don't have the evidence. We do see mass graves. We do ma see mass murder. Uh, we we do see wanton destruction of cities. We literally see everything or almost everything that we've seen in Bosnia 30 years ago. Um, and these things will not go away um, because you know Western leaders need to stop pretending that that guys like Putin will work with them. It's not going to happen. End of story. Um, or 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 some others. Um, so that's essentially what needs to happen. Okay, we need to we need to uh, understand that the fact that two countries, the fact that there are warring factions, does not mean that one of the factions does not have genocidal intent, okay? Because 
Right now, our idea of genocide is, is a situation where victims are completely without agency, that they surrender voluntarily and are slaughtered in mass. Um, I don't think that the existence of the existence of worry, you know, worrying factions and genocide exclude one another or preclude one another. So I believe that that lesson has also been learned now and that that it's been taken into account. Um, and finally, you know, this is how countries. I, I also believe that there is more at stake in Ukraine than meets the eye. I mean, for us in Bosnia, it was really uh, it was a scary time as well because there was a lot of noise on the part of uh, mainly Bosnia Serb separatists around the time the Russians were moving on Ukraine and, and around Ukraine. Um, a lot of people expected things to um, get out get out of hand at least. Uh, thankfully, it didn't happen, and it didn't happen because the, the Ukrainian people uh, decided to stand up and defend their freedom, defend their sovereignty, defend their liberty, um, and in doing so, defended pretty much all of us uh, and a lot of other people in Europe. And I think that they deserve to be protected, that they, they deserve to be supported in any way, shape, or form. And um, yeah, that's, that's that, I guess. Okay, thank you. So you were a very young, you were very young when you became a survivor, as you said, and you told us that this genocide and efforts to bring it to justice allowed you to grow into who you are today, be an activist. Um, so I want to ask you, um, what would be your suggestions for children all around the world, but especially in war zones, doing their best for survival? Well, I can't... Um... How can I say? I don't think there is a recipe. I don't think there is a, a recipe that is applicable from one mass murder, mass atrocity to another. Um, I know that for me, it was books that saved me. And I mean, literally, they saved me because I got to read. And they saved me also because one of those books was, uh, or a bunch of books, books was, were um, English language uh, textbooks. So I started learning English. And uh, later on, um, my knowledge of a few hundred words of English came in really handy, uh, to say the least. Uh, so, I, you know, by extension, I suppose that if if there's knowledge of one thing or another is what gets you out um you know it's 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 the, the schindler's list is an is an instructive film in that regard i i love that i mean love i i know you know what i mean it's a, it's a fantastic film and i um i've seen it more than once and it, it because it, it tells that part of the story really well uh, even though, you know, um, it's still more a film that's focused on the murder, but it's, you know, it's also focused on, on, on the people who got by and survived because they knew things, all right, they had. So, and that's, you know, the thing is, when you find yourself in a situation like that, you will rarely ever be in a situation, you know, it will rarely or never happen in a way where there is even a semblance of the rule of law. So it's really a competition that you're entering and your own skin is on the line. And you know, your skin is one of the few things you can't change about yourself. No way, right? Um, so you have to embrace your skin and um, you have to be really focused on surviving one day at a time, you know, just getting into the house or wherever it is at night alive, waking up the next morning and making sure that you, you know, go to bed alive. And uh, it doesn't allow for a lot of mid or long term planning, but that's how you survive. 
So would you say that books brought you hope during the war um, and not? Uh, well, that book has given me a, a, a skill. And that book, I mean, the, 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 the English dictionary has given me a skill that very few other people had in town, which was really because English wasn't a very popular language in socialist Yugoslavia, and we all came out of Yugoslav elementary or high schools. So I knew a few hundred words of English when the first UN troops came in. And eventually I decided that I was going to learn that dictionary by heart. And I think I was pretty much on the way there. Um, and I started working as an interpreter initially for three meals a day, to be completely honest. And I was really, really happy because uh, we had three meals a day. That was like it. Um, and after that, this guy from Sweden came, you know, and with this typical Scandinavian consciousness or conscientiousness, conscientiousness decided that we were supposed to have contracts and that we were supposed to take tests like all other local personnel in all other offices. And he actually made that happen. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's what this particular book, you know, provided for me. And when I stood before Ratko Mladic on, on July 12th, 1995, um, I stood with a small yellow card. And that small yellow card meant that I was local staff of the United Nations. And not that he would have cared under different circumstances, but there were also international foreign witnesses. And um, so I got off. And after that, as I said, waited for another for about another week or so before I was sure that I was going to get out. Um, so what would you say was the thing that brought the people of Srebrenica hope during um, the events that happened? Uh, you know, for guys, I believe, and I'm making this particularly, in 1994, it was, it was really all about World Cup. And you could see people taking uh, the bicycles and TV sets and small dynamos to produce electricity and climbing up the hill above the town uh, in order to watch um, uh, in order to watch um, football uh, or soccer, right? That's how you guys say it. Um, and but th there wasn't very much. You know, there wasn't very much hope, especially in 93 and 94, when it became obvious that it was going to be a dragged out existence um, under siege, uh, fully encircled and cut off from the rest of the country, uh, unreachable really to any Bosnian um, government or military operation. All right, that's how far flung it was in relation to the rest of the Bosnian territory that was held by the Bosnian government. So, um, yeah, that that was that was part of um, that was a little darker part of that of that existence. Um, you know, I, I guess the only thing that gave you hope was seeing the person next to you still alive i don't know i'm i wasn't very hopeful back then i'm, I'm not a, a very hopeful person i'm more of a, a pragmatist um but yeah i mean i could say i could say it was quite hopeless honestly and it was pretty hopeless from the get-go um so, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that. So it's the very humane things that keep you going. What's well, the very humane thing that keeps me going? Uh, well, right now it's my daughter. I, um, 
I, my wife and I, we had a daughter two years ago, um, and um, it was also after a long uh, struggle, uh, and we got her, um, and she is, how can I say, um, she's the cutest thing that it, out there, um, and um, she's now at the age where she's moving from terrible to horrible, uh, but hey, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. Um, I mean, that's like, you know, all joking aside, um, you know, the, 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 the backstory, of course, to her coming to this world is my mom dying and they missed each other um, by, by some months. And, um, and I keep thinking, you know, and I really do, I keep thinking that how happy mom would have been to see her. And interestingly, very recently, um, my daughter, who's two, has started asking me, where are your daddy and mommy? And, and none of them are alive. And I don't know how to, how to tell her that. And uh, so we keep postponing that conversation, but we're having a great time. And she keeps me completely grounded. Um, and for a person of my, um, proclivities, that is very important. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, I want to ask, and you're bringing up this, like new generations are what's keeping you going, but how did Bosnia reconcile after the war and how did the survivors of Srebrenica reconcile after? Well, here's here's the thing. Uh, reconciliation has become a, a pretty bad word in Bosnia, and not because people don't want to reconcile, but because we haven't given it a, a definition of any sort yet. You know, we don't know what the content of the term is. Nobody's saying we shouldn't try that, but you know, what is it? Is are, are we going to convene a formal truth and reconciliation commission like in South Africa and produce a a report and conclusions and policy proposals? Are we going to do it in a, in a way where we will hunt down and try every single person, uh, uh, indict and try and send away every single person who has taken part in anything criminal, which is well nigh impossible? Um, what are we going to do with that? You know, are we going to have maybe something that I would, for instance, support, um, something along the lines of, of an open-ended storytelling mechanism, you know, where people, where there would be no foregone conclusion in terms of a report or policy proposal or recommendations. Um, personally, for me, uh, for me, uh, the single most uh, important thing is to get all these stories on the record. Um, and, and, you know, I'd prefer to have a conversation about reconciliation in more personal terms. I believe reconciliation is, is more intimate, more personal. Um, you know, I could, exp I could talk to you now about, I mean, if we were, if you were my psychiatrist, uh, I could talk to you now about, you know, how I began to reconcile with what happened to me. And this had, and, you know, in that regard, there has been um, a reconciliation process for me. Um, how can I say, you know, I've learned to live uh, or I'm learning to live with things that have happened to me. That's... Um, that's how I see reconciliation, you know, embracing your own experience. Once again, embracing your own skin takes a long, uh, takes a while, but eventually you realize you have nowhere else to go. You have no other skin to move into. And what, what do you think is the, like, importance of keeping these stories and uh, records in, like, um, in a concrete place? And... You know, could you talk about a little bit about what you do at the Memorial Center? Well, 
as, as I said earlier, our, our, first of all, we didn't own a lot of our story as late as, as 20 years ago. Um, the Serbs had the bodies, the tribunal had the evidence, other evidence. Um, as I said, not even testimony was recorded in our own, I mean, on paper, in our own language. Yes, of course, there, there's video, but it's not part of the, you know, official record. Um, we didn't know it, own any little, and we owned a plot of land in, in Srebrenica, and we owned this building where I'm sitting now, and that was it, and nothing else, not, not, not a single aspect of our story, of our narrative. And that went on for a while. And it went on because the idea was that people would come here once a year, bury their loved ones, and go back. Um, and then some three and a half, three years ago, uh, a bunch of us came in, uh, not necessarily new people. We were all around. Uh, most of us are survivors. In fact, I believe there is uh, that here physically, um, we have people working who have either survived or been born into families of survivors after the war. I have a bunch of kids who are like 96, 97, 99 working for the memorial. So and that, yeah, I take pride in that. Um, I, I take pride in, in the, you know, in, in, in the idea that we're actually creating a next generation here. Uh, and there's, you know, uh, young and educated and smart people. Um, and I'm so glad to be around them, trust me. Um, so when we, let me just yeah get back to what I was saying. When we came here, we said, okay, let's take our story. Let's, you know, come into our own story. Uh, and we started doing that. Um, and we started doing that in many ways. Uh, we started doing that by changing the geography of this place uh, as a first step. You know, this is not a former... Um, a Dutch, uh, ba a Dutch uh, base. This is not a former UN base. This is not uh, a former car battery factory. This is the memorial center of Severance. End of story. Uh, so that's that's thing number one. Um, and that's where you're coming when you come here. Um, number two, we you know went out and we massively recorded, uh, you know, as massively as we could. Uh, recorded oral histories, and we worked hand in hand with Shoah Foundation on recording those oral histories and indexing them. And you know, they trained our people. We had some. We had a uh, initial help from from our friends over at U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, and we will continue to you know to develop this program because it's, as I said, it's not only about what's on the judicial record. We're creating a historical record and. We, um, we, we were not in that regard obliged by any one court decision. Um, the other thing that we're doing, we're creating this community archive of physical things, if I can you know, put it that way. Um, we're out there collecting things from family, families, I'm sorry. Um, we're out there retracing the steps of death march from 1995, collecting artifacts that we still find 27 years later in the woods. Uh, we conserve them. We have exhibited some of them. Uh, we use them to tell the story. Um, so we have started finally reconstructing this place, uh, reconstructing, refurbishing, cons conserving, restoring where you know where necessary. And that's going to take a long while. Uh, this is a huge, huge um, location. Uh, our, our main building alone is 16,000 square meters plus seven and a half thousand square meters. So it's like I can display the history of humanity here if I, you know, if I had the funds and resources to put up such an exhibition. Um, we, uh, we work, um, we try and produce, how can I say, exhibitions and content uh, as much as we can, we believe that this our story is not out there enough. Um, we are now in the middle of working on a, on a first full time 
you know, permanent Severance exhibition that tells the whole story. So not only just the five days of July 1995 and the months following that, but all the three and a half years of siege, of brutality, uh, of mass murder. Um, so we hope to tell, as I said, we hope to tell the whole story for the first time and we to do it here uh, at this place because this place also has it, you know, certain historicity for us. Um, and, you know, as I said, we are a pretty unique group of people in, in, in even in this uh, part of the world, we're all survivors. Um, some of us are so young to be actually descendants of survivors. Some of us are that old to be, uh, you know, uh, survivors. Um, and, um, and, you know, our main, our, 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 our uh, I'm sorry, um, steering board um, for the first time is actually made up of people who are survivors. So um, and there's a vision, there's a shared vision of what this place is supposed to be. Uh, we don't even have to communicate it very often. We know that we want this place to be a place that, you know, inspires a place where, where people learn, where people learn and, and are inspired to go back home and to apply these lessons and to do something for um, those weaker or weakest around them, uh, to protect them, to protect, uh, you know, because these values are best stopped uh, at your own door because that's where they're, where it's cheapest to stop them. That's where, it, you know, it doesn't cost a lot to stop them. If you get them, if, if they get out of hand, then we all have to pay, we all have to chip in and we all have to usually pay with blood. So, um, you know, go in and go early and go, you know, uh, go with a big stick. Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, what you said about reclaiming your own narrative and, you know, um, it's so empowering as someone who believes in justice that I hope that we can all, you know, do it. Uh, so our next question is from the audience, actually, and they're asking, about um, you know, genocide is a complicated action for most people to understand. How does it happen, and what are the conditions that allow for genocide to happen? Well, um, it's a very long and complicated question, and would, I could probably go on talking about that for another 40, forty-five hours. But yes, it, it, it is a very complicated question, even if you will, in in mechanical terms. A genocide requires many moving parts, many different moving parts to come together. Um, it needs to be organized. Uh, transportation needs to be secured. Uh, oil uh, or fuel needs to be secured. People need to be secured. Guards. Uh, there is an entire uh, blindfolds, uh, ligatures. There is an entire logistical process to genocide, and that requires usually people or individuals from more than one institution or one agency. Um, so that's you know that that's what we need to understand. That's how complicated and complex it is. Um, it also is very complex in the in the sense that genocidaires genocid uh, go out of their way to conceal their activities or to present them in a different light or to organize them in a way where pa the pattern will not be immediately obvious. Uh, the, 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 the thing with, the, uh, with Radovan Karadzic's genocide in Bosnia is that it was very decentralized because the eventual decision about whether to kill, rape, murder, what it, you know, burn down, and <clears throat> and so on, was made by was made locally. But if you compare two different municipalities in two different parts of the country, you will find the same plan, the same, you know, this unity of purpose. So that's. Uh, also something to be taken into account. And finally, uh, the single most important, you know, it starts with words. Uh, that's why hate speech and, and hate are so dangerous, because it starts with words. I was 14 years old when uh, a guy that I went to the same class with for seven years turned around me, to me and said, you know, he swore at me and he called me a Turk. And I was quite shocked because I couldn't quite understand what it is that I had 
do with Turks. I, I believe that at that point in my life, I didn't see, know a single living, breathing Turk. I would, I would have had no idea what these guys, what these people look like, because my image of the Turks was the image from the, you know, Yugoslav curriculum. So why would you, for goodness sake, call me a Turk? Anyway, uh, but it starts with that. Of course, I realized later and I realize now uh, why that would be, um, why he said what he said. Uh, but it starts with words. It starts with this idea of construction, of social construction of a mortal threat that needs to be handled if the group in question wants to survive. So yeah, this, this is the shortest I can answer your question. Thank you so much for that answer. And what would you, what would your message be to the students listening in today? Um, and what would you like to end with? Um, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't like messages. Uh, I don't like sending messages. I used to do election campaigns, and um, and you know, uh, so and messaging, messaging actually used to be my forte, but um, I, I got out of the business, and I'm, I'm not necessarily you know, in the business of, of sending messages any longer. But uh, my advice would be, you know, if I can give you an advice that's complete, maybe perhaps unrelated to, uh, to this particular conversation or, uh, you know, knowledge, you know, go out there and learn whatever you think, you, you think is, is important, whatever, whatever you think you can learn, whatever you think, Whatever you find interesting, go pursue your passions, pursue, you know, uh, if you want to learn, if you want to know, if you want to get to know the world. Um, I have had um, a, a different kind of life, but I have managed to rediscover the world again. And that's been the single most important discovery of my life, that there is a world out there, that there is a world outside my world that um, good things also happen in this world and that good things are worth fighting for. Um, so that's what I would um, tell you guys to do. Go out there and uh, um, you know, learn about this place where you live. Um, learn about the, the, your, your town. Learn about, you know, whatever. Just um, And, of course, yeah, I also have a, a, a very Protestant working ethic. So if you can combine the two, so much the better. Thank you so much, Amir, for making this conversation happen today. Thank you, Karen. And thank you to all of you who tuned in today to be a part of this conversation. If you enjoyed this event, let us know by sharing it with your friends and connections on whatever social platform you choose. And remember to follow RFK Human Rights on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube so you can be one of the first people to learn about our next event. Thank you for watching.